Hi, welcome back to our study in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're in chapter 17 today. Hopefully you had a chance uh, to read that and to kind of get a little bit familiar with it. We'll read it here in just a minute. Uh, but I hope this study through the book has been encouraging to you, uh, has challenged you in some ways of viewing the book, and, and hopefully has simplified the book for you. And maybe taken some of the mystery out of it and, and, and brought, brought the victory that's in the book to light. Uh, okay, just some by way of review, uh, some ideas that uh, the we see in the book. First off, the book is written in symbols and there is a timeline. These are the two keys uh, that we talk about in understanding the book of Revelation uh, time and time again. If you're if you're not looking at the book from John's perspective, if you're not looking at it from the way that the Holy Spirit is telling us to interpret it, uh, then we're probably going to be misguided. We, we are going to be misguided. And so the key here is letting, letting God tell us how to understand the book, that it's written in symbols and that there is a timeline and that these things are going to happen soon. Uh, and so over and over again, we look at this slide every time uh, because I think this is critical to let, let the book tell us how to understand it. Uh, okay, uh, we're looking at the, the book as seven parallel views. Uh, we're in the fifth view right now, which is the fall of Babylon is, is the main uh, subject matter. Uh, and that's in chapter 17 and 18. Uh, when we kind of look at the views played out, uh, the first one, uh, and they kind of get a little, you know, less complicated as you go. Maybe not, you know, completely follow that pattern. Uh, but you'll notice uh, our parallel view this time, chapter 17 and 18, we're just talking about the judgment of Rome. And that's where a lot of the, the end chapters of the book are going to be focusing on. Uh, okay, uh, let's go ahead and read chapter 17. Uh, and then we'll start figuring out uh, who this woman is and who this beast is and, and all of these uh, things here. So, Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. Let's read. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke to me, saying, Come here. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth commit acts of immorality. And those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of unclean things of her immorality. And upon her head, on upon her forehead, a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, <clears throat> Why do you wonder? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not, and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. <clears throat> and those who dwell on the earth will wonder, whose name has been written in the book of life, <clears throat> whose name has not been written, in the book of life from the foundations of the world. Then they will see the beast. <coughs> Excuse me. When they see the beast, that he was and is not and will come. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. <coughs> and when he comes, he must remain a little while. <clears throat> and the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven and he goes to destruction and the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom but they received authority as kings with the beast for one hour these have one purpose and they give their power and authority to the beast these will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And those who are with him are called the chosen and the faithful. And he said to me, The waters which you saw, 
which on which the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues and the ten horns which you saw and the beast these will hate the harlot and will make her desolation make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire for the God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Okay, there's chapter 17. Uh, it's, it's a full chapter. There's a lot going on here. Uh, we're going to do our best uh, to, to pull this together and, and figure out what John is talking about. First off, what do we know about this woman that he's talking about? Uh, she's called a harlot. Uh, in verse 5, she's called the mother of harlots and the mother of the abominations of the earth. Uh, this is obviously not a good title for a woman to hold. Uh, but this woman is described as those who would uh, oppose morality, those who would oppose righteousness, right? being the harlot and the mother of harlots. Uh, interestingly, as you go back into the Old Testament, into our prophetic literature, uh, books like Isaiah and Nahum uh, and Ezekiel are of, uh, often describing uh, foreign nations, uh, idolatrous nations, wicked nations as harlots. He even describes his own people as harlots. Uh, in Jerusalem is described as a harlot in Isaiah chapter 1. And uh, obviously uh, the, the, whole, the whole country of Judah is described as a harlot uh, as God tells um, Hosea to, to take a, a harlot as a wife and, and God is using that image. So there's a lot of imagery that God uses of wicked nations as harlots. Sometimes that's his own people even. But here, this is the mother of the harlots. Uh, and this woman is far wicked than any that God has dealt with so far. All right, we see that she sits on many waters in verse 2. And this, there's some really helpful things in, verse, in chapter 17. John's going to tell us, or he's going to be told, what a lot of these visions mean. And so we don't really have to guess at them. Uh, and sometimes when the Holy Spirit tells us what these visions mean, <laughs> we're still uh, almost equally as confused uh, with the answers as we were with the questions. But what we do know, the, the waters that the, um, the woman is seated on, in verse 15, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. Uh, we've talked about the water before the throne before how it represents uh, a multitude of people and sometimes that that people represents different things uh, but here we have the people of the world this is what the beast and the harlot are sitting on uh, what else do we know about the woman uh, the kings of the earth commit immorality with her in verse 2 uh, and they're drunk on the wine of her immorality uh, and so we know not only did her immorality affect her own citizens, but it, it reached out to other kingdoms. Uh, okay, what else do we know about the woman? She's sitting on a scarlet beast in verse 3. Uh, and this beast is described as having seven heads and ten horns. Uh, and we've seen this image before. We saw it in chapter 13, verse 1, when it was the beast that came up out of the sea. Uh, we saw it in chapter 12, verse 3, in a description of the dragon. Um, this is a, a common description that's used in Revelation. Uh, I don't know that uh, the, the description is succinct to always describing the same thing because we definitely see this describing the beast in chapter 13 and the dragon in chapter 12. And so we need to kind of be flexible with how we understand it uh, in, the, in really understanding it within the context that we have. And especially here in chapter 17, uh, we're going to be told exactly what the beast is in, in some pretty intricate detail. All right, uh, so continuing on, uh, without getting too sidetracked on the beast, uh, we're still talking about the woman. What else do we know about this woman? Uh, she's dressed in purple and scarlet. She's wearing gold and jewelry. She's holding uh, a cup that is full of abominations. Uh, and on her forehead is named Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. All right, so this is kind of the, the a depiction of royalty until you kind of start getting out, down to having this cup full of abominations and being called a great harlot. Uh, but what we have is a picture of forsaken royalty, wicked royalty, evil royalty, uh, royalty that has forsaken God. And again, we see the name Babylon come up. And remember, 
Babylon is this image of a kingdom that oppressed God's people in the captivity, but before the captivity as well, uh, as they conquered the northern kingdoms. Uh, well, I guess Assyria conquered the northern kingdoms, but then Babylon came and, and conquered uh, them and pre pressed all the way up you know, into Jerusalem, eventually conquered Jerusalem and took the, the the two southern tribes of Judah into captivity. So <clears throat> when John talks about Babylon, which is a kingdom that's that's long gone at this point, but in the Jewish mind, that brings up all this imagery of a wicked kingdom that oppressed God's people. Right? And that's who Babylon is in the, the Jewish Christian mind of the first century. Uh, and so this image of a king, of a wicked king, uh, is uh, kind of the description of the woman. All right, so all in all, what do we know? She's immoral. She's called Babylon. She persecutes the saints. Uh, we see in chapter uh, 17, verse 9, she sits on seven hills. And then, verse 18, we see that she rules the earth, and she is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And so John just all but tells us that the woman is Rome. Right? She is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So a lot of interpretation going on for us in chapter 17, which helps us to see a few things. A, what's going on in chapter 17, but also helps us to see that we've been on the right track this whole time. That the things that the book of Revelation has been describing, uh, we're seeing come to fruition right here uh, in a little bit more detail. Okay, what do we know about the beast? So that was the woman described in her harlotries and her wickedness and, and drawing not just her own people but kings of the earth into her immorality. And that's Rome. Well, what's the beast? Is, and, and it's going to be a lot of similar ideas. But let's see how it's described. Verse 7, right? The angel promises John an explanation, which is really exciting. Uh, and so what we know is verse 8, the beast comes up out of the bottomless pit and is going to destruction. Uh, the beast has seven heads, which are seven mountains and seven kings. Right, so we start to see that uh, imagery can have multiple fulfillments, uh, which only completely complicates the whole book, right? <laughs> uh, but here's the Holy Spirit's interpretation. There's seven mountains, and they also represent seven kings. The ten horns <coughs> represent ten kings. All right? And the beast, in verse 16, will hate the harlot. All right, so what do we know about, let's just kind of explore some of these ideas. The abyss, right? The beast is something that comes up out of the abyss. We see in Luke chapter 8, verse 31, the abyss is where the demons dwell. In Revelation 9, a star is given the key to the abyss in which a locust plague comes up out of the abyss and Satan is the king of their army. In chapter 11, the, beast, or the abyss is the home of the beast that kills the two witnesses. Here in chapter 17 that we're talking about, the beast that the harlot rides on comes up out of the abyss. In chapter 20, an angel is given a key to the abyss and in chapter 20, Satan is cast into the abyss for a thousand years and he's released and defeated. But here's what we know about the, the abyss. And so really what we're saying is this idea that the beast that the woman is riding on is coming with the full authority of hell. The full authority of Satan and hell because the abyss is where Satan dwells. Alright, what do we know about the beast through the book of Revelation? In chapter 11, the beast came up out of the abyss, remember, and killed two witnesses. In chapter 13, the beast came up out of the sea, and it had ten horns and seven heads, just like we see in 17. But it was described as a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Remember, we, we pulled in Daniel's prophecy, and we looked at those three beasts, and Rome being the culmination of those three preceding kingdoms, uh, that were described as a leopard, a bear, and a lion. From chapter 13, we know the beast receives power from the dragon, who is Satan, and the beast receives worship. Right, so we looked at the beast as this kind of Rome demanding emperor worship. When we get to chapter 17, uh, we see that those seven heads are seven mountains, and those uh, the seven heads are also seven kings. 
In chapter 19, the beast is going to assimilate all the kings of the earth and come and fight against God. And in chapter 19, the beast is cast into the lake of fire, which happens to also be where Satan is thrown. So here's what we know about the beast so far, just kind of a synopsis of uh, the, the times that we've encountered the beast and what we know about the beast. Uh, okay, so the beast is absolutely connected with Rome and the emperors and emperor worship. Uh, and uh, so we have the woman who is obviously Rome. John tells us that in verse 18. And she's riding on a beast, which is maybe the emperors or emperor worship or another kind of concept of uh, the, the Roman Empire. Some people look at uh, these images as like the political spectrum of the Roman Empire and then the religious spectrum of the Roman Empire. One being Rome as a nation and, and the other being really culminated in the emperor's declaring themselves as divinity uh, so but the woman and the beast are intricately connected you can't really separate them uh, and uh, so what do we know continue on what do we know about the beast there's descriptions of them starting in verse 8 they get a little bit tricky and a little bit complicated and honestly a little bit fun so let's see if we can figure out what's going on with this when you read 8 through 11 there's there's a lot going on and so I think it's helpful if we break it down into three segments. The first one is verse 8, where the beasts are described as one who was, is not, and is about to come and go into destruction. Okay? And then starting in verse 10, we, we kind of have a reset a little bit, if you'll let it be. Uh, and now we have seven heads, which are seven kings. And he describes those as one having, or five having fallen, one is and one is yet to come but remains for a little while and then there's an eighth king and that eighth king is described as you know was and is not and it belongs to the seven kings so keep all of those kings together and then there's a third group called the ten horns and the ten horns are ten kings who have not received power but are going to make war with the lamb right and we know that the horns and the beast are going to hate the harlot uh, from uh, verses 15 through 18 in that that final that conclusion section uh, which is kind of interesting because if you have if we're looking at it from the picture of the roman empire what you see is the kings themselves are hating the roman empire uh, indicative of the the internal destruction that really brought rome down the internal corruption uh, and immorality that brought rome down Okay, but really, we're going we're gonna to look at it in these three pieces in order to try and understand it. Verse 8, now the beast was described as was, is not, and about to come. Verses 10 and 11, describing these seven kings, and then an eighth king tacked on there. And then the ten horns. So keeping those three separate, that's kind of our outline for how we're going to figure out what's going on with all of this. Uh, and, and maybe just a caveat. There's a lot of disagreement as to what all of these kings mean and who these kings are. Uh, so I'm going to give you my best conclusions. And if you work through it and, and you're like, that doesn't make sense, Steve. Great. More power to you. I would encourage you to study through this and figure this out and, and come to the very best conclusion that you can, that you can. But as long as your conclusions are consistent with the rest of the message and Especially the, the message that we see right here in chapter 17, verse 18, when we know that the woman that we saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Like, we got to keep it within that context. And so, trying to figure that out can be kind of tricky, but here we go. Let's, let's see what we can do. First off, here's our listing, and we've, we've seen this before. I've, I've shown you this listing of the rulers, uh, the emperors of Rome, starting with Augustus, uh, who uh, was kind of the first ruler that we see on scene in the new testament all right and moving all the way down to domitian obviously there's lots of of emperors uh on uh, following domitian but we're just going to look it up to him for now so let's read verse 8 again and see if we can figure out where we're at the the beast which you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go into destruction all right, so the beast that was 
we're going to talk about when we talk about the beast we're talking about a persecuting force against god's people and the first persecuting force was nero that's when uh rome burned nero blamed the christians and this persecution against the church started from a roman perspective all right and so from our dating of the book we're 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 kind of perceiving revelation written around 90 to 96 AD so way down in the reign of Domitian so this would be an emperor who was right during the time that the persecution began right and then we have this group who is and is not and that's an interesting phrase right who or you saw one who was and is not so we have this is not group right and from a pers persecution perspective these are the kings where the persecution died down. It ramped up during Nero, and then it kind of died down as a lot of the attention was given to both internal problems with Rome and Jewish problems that they had to deal with. And so Titus ends up conquering Jerusalem, and those problems are resolved. The next emperor, Domitian, revives the persecution against christians and so that's the one who is about to come and so maybe we can we can see that domitian is about to ramp up this persecution uh, and and that's where we're at all right so that would be my best understanding of verse eight the, wh who one was is not and about to come uh, and maybe you can look at uh look at this text and come up with a better explanation than how i'd love i'd love for that to happen all right, so that's verse 8. Let's look at verses 9 through 11. All right. Here's the mind that has wisdom. Seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. And then he's going to describe these seven kings. Five have fallen. So if we look at the first five, all right, we have Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. Those five have fallen one is right now this is a little bit different because if you'll notice these these next three galba otho and vitellius right this is a time where people were holding the role of emperor for for months not years and good this was a time of chaos and uh, people were uh, were taking the throne and being executed and and being uh being conspired against and killed all right, and so these three emperors, maybe for our count, don't really, don't really come into play here. If you go back to Daniel, when Daniel is talking about the ten horns and then a little horn that springs up in his revelation, he talks about three of the horns that are taken out of the way. And it might be these very three emperors who really don't have much of a, a say into what happens. They don't really play much into the history of the Roman Empire because it was a time of chaos and their reigns were so short. All right, so if we don't count these kings, <clears throat> then we have one who is, who would be Vespasian, right? And uh, where we're at in verse, sorry, jump down into verse 10, right? We have five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain for a little while. So here's one who will come for a little while, Titus. And then you have the beast which was and is not, is himself also an eighth. So the eighth is described as was and is not. Now what's difficult what is to try and maybe put too much emphasis on the tense of those verbs you have one is one will come and one was and is not and so you want to think about oh well then obviously john is writing during the reign of vespasian but that doesn't make sense because if one is and one will come okay that timeline makes sense but then the eighth king was is is past tense <laughs> And so that, all of a sudden, it doesn't make sense. So maybe there's something deeper besides just giving us a chronology of the kings. Maybe there's a description of what these kings are going to be like in this. 
because we know if we just we look at the five have fallen and then we ignore the three kings that didn't really have much of a rule <clears throat> we have one is one will come for a little while right and uh, Titus didn't rule for very long uh, just two years which was a, a lot more than Otho did but a, a small ruling and then Domitian is a time when persecution just flares up big Right. A lot of persecution for the church under Domitian. And he's described as was and is not. And I wonder, I wonder if was and is not is actually a contrast to the I am. One of the biggest, obviously, problems with the Roman emperors was they were claiming to be God and needing to be worshipped. And so Christians had to choose whether they were going to worship the emperor, go in... Uh, to their little altars and put some incense on that altar, declare their allegiance to Caesar. You know, it was a very, very simple thing to do, yet Christians were morally at odds with worshiping emperors for obvious reasons. And so could this final, this eighth king, who brings on some of the ugliest persecution against the church, be declared as the opposite of the I am? The was and is not, not the I am. That's the best I can I can think of because otherwise the timeline doesn't really make sense to have one is, one will come, and then we jump to the past tense. So I think there's got to be something deeper than just who's, who's coming next. Although the next would be Domitian in verse 8. Okay, so that would be uh, those seven horns. Uh, or the seven heads. Now, verses 12 through 14 talk about ten horns who are ten kings. So who are these ten kings? And let's let's look at this separately from all of this. Otherwise, uh, they, they all start to run together and get confused. Now, these ten kings, notice in verse 12, these ten horns which you saw are ten kings. We're in verse 12. Who have not yet received a kingdom. So I think these are emperors that are in the future, that are to come. They haven't arrived yet. They receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. All right, so they all get their time getting their authority from the beast. These emperors are receiving their authority from the beast uh, for their one hour. And they wage war against the lamb in verse 14. So I think these are the future kings that come after Domitian. Uh, and they're described as ten kings, maybe not so much to let's start listing ten kings, but to talk about a full number of kings. And and just to make a sidebar, we would normally interpret seven as the number of, you know, a, a whole full complete number, like a divine number. We would look at the number ten as a full complete round number. <clears throat> but on the occasions, like in verse ten, when John starts breaking it down and telling us, like, how many kings did this and how many kings did that, we leave that figurative and we, we jump to, okay, here's the interpretation of it. Like, it's not a full, complete, it is seven kings, and, and here's, what they, here's what they mean. All right, so these ten kings... <clears throat> Uh, maybe these are our client kings that Rome ruled through these uh, local rulers uh, as just a way to continue to exert her dominance over the world and over uh, Christianity in general. They receive power from the beast, and but notice they give it right back to the beast. right? Or maybe just verse or 10 is like this big round number like we've been saying. But what we do know is these kings are at war with the Lamb. And so whoever comes after Domitian continues to make war with the Lamb. Uh, and what we know in verse 14 is that they will not be successful, right? They're coming up against the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and those whose names have been written in the Book of Life since the foundation of the world. All right, so here's the reason for the Lamb's victory, right? That the Lamb is the King of Kings, and this takes on, like this imagery of the king of kings takes on a really cool meaning when you talk about the lamb going against the kings of the earth. That Jesus is 
not the king, but he is the king of all kings, even the Roman emperors. So what a powerful message to the first century church. Like we, we think about Jesus as the king of kings, and it's this, this message, uh, this image of, of power and authority. But we don't really have a king, so we don't take it personally. The first century Christians lived under an emperor. They would take this king of kings much more personally. So he's, they're going to wage war against the lamb, and the lamb is going to overcome. Like, boom. Th what a great message of hope. All of these kings are going to rise. They're going to bring persecution. But the lamb will be victorious against them. Uh, now, look at verses 16 and 17. This is interesting to me. All right, we saw in verse 15 what the waters were. Now, verse 16, the ten horns which you saw in the beast, they will hate the harlot. So we have this internal conflict between the emperors and the nation, and there's all this internal corruption and destruction going on, and they will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her with fire. Very indicative of what happened to Rome Right, this internal conflict and corruption which brought Rome down. Now, in verse 17, God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose. What a powerful verse in this book that God is executing his purpose through Rome. Now, the Roman Empire is a wicked nation, and, and they're, they're calling God's people to do wicked things, but God had a purpose for Rome. There was a lot of blessings about Rome, being the empire in which God would choose to bring the Messiah so that the, the message of the gospel could go to all of the world. That needed the Roman Empire. And so God created and brought into power the Roman Empire, and he is using it to execute his purpose. Isn't that awesome? Even this, this wicked nation God is using to execute his purpose. And that's nothing new. God did that with Assyria. God did that with Babylon. God did that with Egypt. God has been doing executing his purpose through godless nations forever. And here he's doing it with Rome. It's not Rome that's in control. When God is done with Rome, when he's finished his purpose with Rome, he will bring Rome down in the persecution and they'll bring peace to his people. And that's exactly what we saw happen in history. What a powerful message that God is the ruler of the earth, the ruler of the creation, the king of kings. All right, that's chapter 17. We're going to pause there. We'll pick up next time with chapter 18. Uh, so if you have some time, reread chapter 17. Keep familiar with it. We're going to move right into chapter 18, looking at more judgment coming on the beast. Uh, all right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word and, and how awesome it is, how it leads us uh, to, to draw conclusions about your holiness and your righteousness and your power. Thank you for your word that gives us truth. Thank you for your word because it lets us see that you are the God that has been since the creation and the foundations of the world. That you have been speaking, that your will has been being made known, and that we can see that working throughout history. It gives us a great confidence in you, Father. And so thank you for that. Uh, but as we encounter your word, give us wisdom, give us understanding, uh, maybe even a little bit more, Father, when we're dealing with the book of Revelation. Uh, it's outside of a cultural norm for us, and it's outside of kind of our, our scope of interpretation. Uh, help us, Father, as we go through to just let you teach us through it. And I pray that you would grant us your wisdom, not the wisdom of the world. And I ask for that through Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks for joining.